All right, let's take our Bibles and let's turn to the book of Jude. We're going to read the whole book. Don't worry, it's only 25 verses long. <clears throat> I'll read the odd-numbered verses on my own. You join me on the even-numbered verses and on the last verse, please. The book of Jude. It's the second book if you start at the end of the Bible and work your way backwards. <clears throat> All right. So here we go. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied beloved when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. These are spots in your feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withered without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murderers, complaining, walking after their own lust, and their mouths speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember yet ye these words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others saving with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted of the flesh, 
now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. And now let's pray. Father, please empower preacher. Help our hearts to be stilled and focused on the word of God. And speak to us and help us to respond properly. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. The wonder of wonders as she looked in his face That this little boy spoke the worlds into place the stars and the moon shining brightly on them the earth and the sun were created by him the wonders of wonders oh how could it be that God became flesh and was given for me. The Almighty came down and walked among men. The wonder of wonders, He died for my sins. The wonder of wonders as she looked down and smiled that he was her maker as well as her child he created the womb that had given him birth he was God incarnate, come down to this earth. The wonder of wonders, oh how could it be that God became flesh and was given for me? The Almighty came down and walked among men. The wonder of wonders, He died for my sins. Thank you, Brother McAllister. Yeah, that should be the, uh, the theme of your heart every day the rest of your life, the wonder that Jesus would die for us. You know, it's something I often think about, the fact that, you know, why, you know, I understand God loves us, but there's still something in me that says, why? Why, why so much? Why do you love us so much? You know, it's something that I really want someday to stand before God and God to really explain everything to me. You know, everything that was in his thought process of, coming from heaven to earth to die for us. So today, we're going to go ahead, and of course, we read the entire book of Jude today. Um, really, what, all of our verses are coming from Jude chapter 1, verses 17 through 25, is where our, all of our text is coming from. Uh, but today's message is our theme message for the year, Make a Difference. Make a difference. The text verse being Jude chapter 20, or Jude verse 22. There's only one chapter of Jude, Jude 1. You know, but Jude in verse 22, and that's, and of some have compassion, making a difference. Of course, the very first or good majority of the book of Jude is a warning. It's an admonition, it's an exhortation to the uh, believers there that it's being written to and to us as believers to be careful. You know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, of wolves amongst the sheep, if you will. You know, or, or individuals that are, are uh, causing division, you know, in Christianity to cause people to fall by the wayside. You know, we do see this warning here. It's hard not to see it. It goes over and over and over and even names some of the very individuals, you know, their, their character, if you will, of how they are. And then we get down towards the middle to end of the chapter and the tone changes. 
hey, there, here's some things that'll help you. Here's some things that you need to adhere to. These are the things that are going to make the difference, not only in your life, but in the lives of others. D.L. Moody said this, the preaching that the world needs most is the sermons in the shoes that are walking with Christ. It's not the word of God. It's you living the word of God. It's how people view you as Christians. That's not saying that the word of God is not important. Because if you're living the word of God, they're going to see that through your life. They're going to see your Christianity put into action. The word of God is important. You know, but you're, I remember uh, 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 Dr. Wendell Evans used to say this when I was in college, and I'm sure he's been saying it for years. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk speaks a lot more volumes than your talk talks. And I, of course, I paraphrase that and add a few words in there. You know, but actions speak louder than words. It's not what you're saying. It's what you're doing that is going to make the difference. You know, we're going to start this every month during this, this next year. We're going to have a, a theme message along of making their difference. And a couple of those are going to be make a difference in your family, make a difference in your community. And it's going to be looking at it from a biblical perspective of what the Bible has to say about making a difference in those areas. But today is going to set the groundwork, the groundwork of what God would want for us as a church this year to make a difference. You know, I thought about this. I, I really struggled this year. I wasn't really sure, and I kept asking and praying God and, and looking at different areas. Lord, what would you want the theme to be this year for our church? You know, Lord, what is it that you want? And, and I know that this is the, the year that we are going to be completing our, our 35th year as a church of being in existence. This, uh, I believe it's April or March, is when uh, we finish 35 years as a church and go into our 36th year. That's a big deal. You know, and I thought about that, and, and God uh, started to get me to think about what God has done in this church, through our church people, you know, through our church as a whole, and the difference that has been made in the last 35 years. And I just couldn't get away from that thought of making a difference, making a difference. And many of you that are in here in this room today are here because someone was used by God from this church to reach you. You know, whether it be a pastor Northrup, or whether it be a pastor Lane, uh, whether it be, you know, their wives or their family members or others that have, have uh, our senior saints that have died and gone on into eternity. I think of Mrs. Sprague and, you know, others that have been greatly influential, greatly influential in this church over the years to make a difference, to make a difference. You know that God wants to do that with you? God still wants to continue to do that with us. You know, I look at the last 35 years and say, man, that's great, but you know what? I want to do more for God. You know, I think of Paul in the Bible, and he says, you know what? I'm always, he's constantly pressing towards the mark, leaving those things behind. Hey, it's great to think about those things that God has done for us in our church over the last 35 years, but what is God, what could God do for us? What could we do for God in 2019 to make a difference, to make a difference? So my question to you this morning is this. It's simple. Will you make a difference for Christ? Will you make a difference? Not saying your mom, not saying your dad, not saying your brother, your sister, your cousin, your aunt, your uncles, your coworkers, your neighbor, your fellow Christians that are sitting in the, in the pews here this morning, but what will you do to make a difference? It is a personal dynamic relationship with Christ, and each and every one of us will be held accountable did we make a difference for Christ? Let me give you some things this morning of how we can make a difference this year coming, uh, this, year, this coming year of 2019. Uh, take your Bibles and uh, keep your places in Jude chapter 1, or in the book of Jude, because we are going to look back at a couple verses. But I uh, turned your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll look at one verse for, at, very, at the very least, one passage for each one of these points. I do have other passages that I'll bring up this morning, so if you're taking notes, you'll want to write some of these down to remind yourself. But uh, number, number one this morning, how can we make a difference in the coming year of 2019? That was something when I was sitting down this, you know, last couple of weeks, I said, you know, what is it that makes the difference? What is it that we could do better in our lives personally to be able to help us to make the difference? Hey, because let's face it, folks, you don't just wake up one morning and say, oh, I'm going to make the difference and not know how to do it. You know, there's a process that happens in order for you to make the difference. You know, there is a, a constant pattern that is followed in order to a successful uh, a, a life of making a difference. You know, I, I look at some of the, the, the great men and, and ladies that have been influential in my life. 
You know, and I look at my home pastor. You know, it's good to see folks that started our church here, that reach out of our church, that are back this morning, and they go to my home church. And I look at my pastor as being highly influential. How did he get to that point of making a difference? I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for people who made a difference in my life. You know, how is it that happened? There's a lot of different ways that that happens, and we will talk about that over the coming months. You know, but at the very least, we're going to talk about a few of these today. So Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 1 through 16. I'm going to give you the uh, point number 1, and this is letter A under point number 1. So no, point number 1, so look back at Jude. You got your Bible there, Jude? Look back at verses 20 and 21. Jude chapter 20, no, sir, Jude, Jude uh, verse number 20 and verse 21. The Bible says this, but, but ye, beloved... Building up yourselves on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Number one, determine, determine to stay close to Christ. Each one of these points starts with a D. I like alliteration. It helps me to remember it and it helps you to remember it. But the first letter D is determine to stay close to Christ. You know, if there's one thing that you could start doing now that should carry on into 2019, it should be determining to stay close to Christ. Not going backwards, but going forwards. You know, if you look at every individual that has done anything for God, the only reason they were able to do it is because of a close relationship with God. You look at the Jack Hiles of, of this world and, you know, the Pastor Lanes of this world and the Pastor Northrop's of this world. And, you know, you go through all these individuals that have been highly influential in their areas of where God has placed them. The only way they could have been successful is by God uh, having a relationship with them and them having a relationship with God. And you say, well, what does that mean to me? Letter A, this is where we get to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. As a church, we need to have unity. As a church, we need to have unity. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verses 1 through 16. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one, one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Hey, that'd make for a good theme for, the, for another year. One, O-N-E. Look how many ones they put there, all, all in this one passage. Who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? but at that ye also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of faith. There's that word unity again. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every Joint supplieth according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I know that's a long passage, but it gives a very clear definition. You know, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, he's a prisoner at this time. He's writing this letter from prison. And he's, he's admonishing them, he's encouraging them to be unified under Christ. To be unified, not to tear each other apart. You know, I mentioned this this morning in my Sunday school class. We're going over the armor of God. And, and uh, you know, we talked about how in order to effectively use armor, you have to know how your enemy operates. You know, and we learned about the enemy. There's three different enemies that the Bible clearly states. Number one, ourselves. You know, we are our own worst enemy. When you wake up in the morning, you look in that mirror, you know, you're looking at your worst enemy for the day. It's not usually the devil. You know, it's, it's, it's yourself. 
The second enemy, obviously, is, is the devil. We understand that he's the enemy that can't be seen. He's sly, he's tactful, he, he slithers in and he, and he gets a foot in the door and, and he exploits our weaknesses. And then we have a third enemy, which is the world. It's the things that are in the world. It's not the people in the world. It's the things that are in the world that would cause us to be distracted. You know, and Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus here, and he's saying, hey, I, I want to make you aware of some things. I want you to understand that in order for you to su be successful as a church, you need to be unified. Each and every one of those individuals in that church, just like each and every one of the individuals that's in this church today, are important. There's not one person that is more important than the other. You know, I as a pastor am not more important than, than you all. You all are not more important than I am. Each and every one of us is important to God. Each and every one of us is, is required in order for us as a church to be successful in making a difference for the cause of Christ. You know, it, it alludes to the fact here a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of giving of individuals for a particular reason, to the edifying and admonishing of the believers. You know, there's a, another passage that talks about spiritual gifts, and I think we'll get into that just a little bit. Um, you know, but at, at the very least, you have to understand that each and every one of you has been gifted in a certain way. Each and every one of you has. You know, some of you have been given spiritual gifts that another person doesn't have. You know, and that helps the church. That helps the body of believers. We're not talking about the building itself. We're talking about the body of believers here. You know, in order for us to be unified, we have to be all on the same page, admonishing one another, helping one another. Hey, it's not for us to say, ha, ah, I knew they were in sin. You know, I knew that they messed up. You know, it serves them right. No, it should be that we go to that individual and help to reclaim them. Help to get them back on track because they're just as important as we are. You know, I learned this, you know, in my younger, younger 20s, my early 20s when I started working with addicts. You know, I'm only one bad decision away from being where they're at. You know, I'm no better than they are. I, I, I could be exactly where they're at. You know, I could, I could make one bad decision and be right, right in, that, in, the, in the cesspits of sin. You know, I'm a sinner just like they are. You know, I need help. You know, we all do. You know, and if I'm healthy now, then I can help someone else out. You know, being there to be able to make a difference, determined to stay close to Christ. As a church, we need to be unified. Unified in what? The purpose. What is the purpose of the church? To go out and get others saved, the lost. You know, helping reach them with the gospel. Go, win, baptize, teach. You know, that's always been the focus since the starting of this church. You know, I've heard the story. I never heard Pastor Lane say this because I never met Pastor Lane. You know, but I remember uh, hearing the story, and I've heard it multiple times now, uh, to the point of where, you know, uh, Pastor Lane, when he was pastoring the previous church to this one, you know, went to a, a, a pastor school out in Hammond, Indiana, and caught the soul winning bug, if you will. You know, he caught the, the uh, uh, really is what the Bible teaches and got on fire for God, came back and said, hey, you know what? We're going to go soul winning. And some people didn't like that, as most people don't, you know, because it's stepping on your toes to go out and tell others about Christ. And, of course, the church didn't want to go that direction from what I've been told. And he got some uh, uh, advice and wisdom from uh, Brother Hiles. Brother Hiles said, well, go start a church then. And that's exactly what he did. That's what we have today. 35 years later, we have this church here still today with the same focus, the same purpose, going out, winning others to Christ, getting them baptized, teaching them how to go out and do likewise so that they can go out and reach someone else. Without that, there is no purpose for church. Without that, there's no vision for church. You know, we have to be determined to stay close to church, unified with the same purpose, unified with leading others to Christ, helping those come back to Christ that may be fallen by the wayside. Let her be under, uh, determined to stay close to Christ as a believer personally. So as a church, unified. But as a believer, you personally have to be determined. You personally have to be determined. Don't just buy into being unified in the church. Hey, that's a good thing, but are you personally determined in your own personal relationship with God? You know, this year you should say, you know what? This is where I'm at with my relationship with God. This is where I want to be. And set some goals you know, I'm not big on, you know, New Year's resolutions because I know that, you know, most of the time we say, oh, my New Year's resolution is to get in shape. And do we ever get in shape? Yeah, we get in shape, just not the shape we want to be in. It's the opposite. You know, we end up becoming a shape. You know, so it's, uh, you know, the fact that I understand, but you should have goals that are set up throughout the year. Hey, you know, these are tangible goals. This is where I want to be at. You should be closer to God by the end of 2019 than you were at the end of 2018. That should be a goal for you. Hey, am I praying more? 
You know, am I closer to God? Am I going to church more? Am I getting more from God? How's my relationship? Have I led more people to Christ than I did the previous year? You know, all of these things, all encapsulize. Everything encapsulizes personally, as a believer, being determined. Being determined to get close to God. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Hey, there may be something in your life today that you need to get out. You know, 2018 is coming to a close. Tomorrow night, 2018 is over. As the stroke of midnight comes, 2019 is going to start. Now would be a good time to determine to weed some things out so that you can get close to God, so that you can have a closer relationship in 2019 than you ever had before. That takes some determination. You know, that takes some determination. You know, working with addicts in Colorado, you know, oftentimes I would tell them, I said, look, in order for you to get victory over this addiction in your life, you need to be determined to get to Christ. You need to be determined to allow Christ to clean you up. You need to be determined to allow God to to influence you in such a way that you're going to have victory in your life. But if you're not determined to do that, there's not any hope for you. You're just going to continue to go through this process, this cycle of trying to help yourself, and you're not going to get anywhere. We can't do it without Christ. We have to have a close relationship with Christ. As a believer personally, determined to stay close to Christ. Number one, determined to stay close to Christ. Number two, look at verse 22 of Jude. Jude, verse 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Number two, so the first one was determine. Number two, deliver. Deliver. Deliver compassion to others. You know, one of the things that bothers me as a Christian, I'm not just saying as a pastor, I've seen this, you know, even before I became a pastor, even before I went into the ministry, one of the things that bothers me as a Christian is the way Christians treat other Christians. You know, it bothers me. Folks, we're all on the same team, and I understand that there are things that are not good things in another Christian's life. You know, but who are we to, you know, cast the stone? You know, who are we to go in and, and, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, take the, the, the beam out of thine eye before you take out the sliver out of the other. You know, yes, you should be able to help someone else out. You know, but don't, don't cast them by the wayside and say, well, man, you're a horrible, wicked, rotten person. I want nothing to do with you. I'm not saying go sin with the individual. I'm tired of reclaiming them. Compassion, that love that's towards the individual. You know, it breaks my heart. You know, I've got friends that I went into the ministry with that are no longer in the ministry. Some of them no longer married to the individuals that they were married to. Some of them are in drugs and alcohol. Some of them are into all, into the pits, the slide pits of sin. But if they call me up and said, I, I want help, I'd be right there to help them. You know, I still keep in contact with them. I still, still tell them I'm praying for them. And I really do mean it I'm praying for them. Compassion. Having a heart for other individuals. Delivering compassion to others. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8-9. through 9. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. You know, God wants us to have his mind, compassion. Think about this. You know, we've done God one of the greatest injustices known, known, you know, since the beginning. We've sinned, yet he still had compassion to us. You know, we looked at it and said, Lord, hey, this is the rules. Who are we on the rules? I don't care. Yeah, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do the one. I'm going to disobey in every area that I can disobey. And yeah, God still had compassion on us. Let that register. Let that sink down in your mind. If God was willing to forgive us, if God was willing to have compassion on us, God wants us to have the same mind. He tells us to be of one mind, having compassion, having compassion, loving. Hey, if we're going to make a difference this year, it's going to take loving on some people. It's going to take having some compassion towards others. You know what? And that has to happen. Hey, it's easy. It's easy to say, you know what? I want nothing, nothing to do with that individual ever again. It's hard to say, you know what? I'm going to choose to love. You know, that goes back to being determined. You know, going back to being determined helps you to deliver. You know, deliver compassion to others. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You know, one of the greatest kindnesses you could show to another individual is to forgive them. To forgive them. God did that for us, for his son's sake. That's how much he loves us. That's how much compassion he had for us. Are you, are, have you, how much compassion have you shown lately? 
You know, you say, well, I haven't really shown a whole lot. You know, if we're all honest with ourselves, we can all be better at giving compassion. You know, this is an area that in, in my life that at times I struggle with. I think we all do. It's real easy to write off people. It's real easy to say, you know what, fine, live there. You know, have fun with it. You know, I'll be here when you come back. You know, you get a real cynical attitude in regards to it. Deliver compassion to others. This 2019, if we're going to reach more people, if we're going to make a difference, we've got to have compassion. We've got to have compassion towards others. We've got to love on others. You know, I've often said this, and this is not my phrase. This I picked up in college, but it, it's a great, great, great saying. People want to know that you care before they want to know what you know. You know, no one's going to change until they know that you care. You know, I certainly didn't change until I knew someone cared for me. You know, until I understood how much God really cares for me, that's when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. That's when I understood, hey, you know what? God really does. Man, God did that for me? You know, I'm a, I'm a wicked, rotten, filthy sinner. God did that for me. That compassion he showed, that helped me to turn to God. You know, think of how many others could turn to God if we just showed a little bit of compassion, if we just dealt with them a little bit of mercy, a little bit of grace. Deliver compassion to others. Number three, look at verse 23 of Jude. Verse 23 of Jude. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Number three, dare. Dare to get involved. So number one, determine. Number two, deliver. Number three, dare to get involved. Dare to get involved. That's a challenge. That's a challenge this year. You know, if you're not involved, get involved. Hey, you know, if you say, I've never led anybody to Christ, do it. Learn how to do it. Hey, I've never brought anybody to church, do it. You know, hey, before I understood how to lead someone to Christ, I started bringing people to church. You know, my two closest friends in high school, I brought them to church, and my pastor was able to lead both of them to the Lord, both of them. You know, I was able to at least have a part in it. Didn't know how to explain it from the Bible successfully. You know, but I was able to get them here. Anybody can do that. You know, anybody can hand out an invitation to church. Anybody can give one of these. It's not hard. Here, you know, I'd like to invite you to church or some information. Maybe a blessing to you. You know, give them the opportunity. You know, dare to get involved. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to look at verse number 58. Dare to get involved. Hey, folks. You know, I want to give you a staggering statistic. You know, if you look at Christianity and you look at Bible-believing churches, you know that 10% of the people do 100% of the work in the church? 10%. You know, what could God do with us if some individuals this year determined, determined to get to the point where they dared to get involved? They get involved. You know, what could God do with our church this year? You know, I honestly believe if each and every one of us focused on getting one family into this church, we would double in size this next year. And I don't say that in means to, oh, I want to have a big church. No, that's not the case. God will bring in who he wants to bring in. But I'm talking about what people could be reached, what lives could be changed because of it. Because that's what matters. You know, it's not how many people we have sitting in the pews. It's how many people's lives are being changed. That's what matters. How many people are getting closer to God? How many people are reaching out to others and fulfilling the gospel? Dare to get involved. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, God wants us to be always abounding in his work. Hey, you know, this is what I did this year. Well, you know what? This coming year, 2019... You could step it up probably. You could do something better. Hey, you know, the one thing I love about the end of 2018 or the end of the year is it's a, it helps us to reevaluate. What, how did 2018 or how did this year go? You know, what changes do I need to make? What adjustments do I need to make? What tweaking needs to be made? It's like working on a car. You know, cars need adjustments from time to time, unfortunately. You know, cars are money pits. You know, they are constantly in need of oil changes and, you know, uh, more fluids and, you know, spark plugs and, you know, maybe a new CV joint here and there because the joints are getting a little rusted out or broken or, you know, new brake pads, you name it. You know, our lives are a machine and they need to be adjusted from time to time. You know, we need to add in here and take away there and, and to get it working fine tunely spiritually speaking. You know, and that takes you daring to get involved. Hey, you know what? I, I need to get involved a little bit this year. You know, I need to, you know, step it up in an area this year. I need to reevaluate how well I did in this area. 
Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 14. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. One of the greatest ways you can make a difference in 2019 is by serving. Serving. You know, and you see in this verse, it talks about love. Love is part of compassion. You know, if our theme verse is, and of some have compassion making a difference, that compassion is going to come through service. That's going to come through serving others. That's going to come through reaching out to those that have a need. Maybe reaching out to those that are down and out. Maybe reaching out to those that, you know, uh, right now uh, are in church this morning other than by sicknesses. You know, maybe it's someone that hasn't been to church in months, maybe years. Maybe it's someone that's in the community that doesn't go to church and has never been to our church. You say, hey, you know what? You know, I'd like to invite you over for a meal. You know, would you come to church with me? We'll have lunch afterwards. You know, whatever you have to do. And they you know, say, well, that's kind of like a bribe, isn't it? You know, that's a good bribe to me. You know, hey, who doesn't like food? You know, I love food. You know, if I, I need food. We all do. You know, but doing whatever we can to show compassion and getting involved in leading others to Christ. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. The Bible says this, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or of the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You say, well, what's that have to do with me? This is Joshua talking to the Israelite people. I'm not an Israelite. I wasn't there. Well, the principle still stands. Who are we going to serve? You're going to serve yourself? You're going to serve God? You're going to serve some other gods? You know, one of the greatest gods we serve today is mammon, money. The Bible calls it filthy lucre. You know, uh, there's uh, individuals out there that I'll chase after for years and years and years and years and years, spend their whole entire life chasing after the almighty dollar and, and won't amount to anything. Yeah, oh yeah, you, I've amassed millions of dollars. Can't take it with you. You know, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You don't. They can't take it with them. You know, they they're can't take them in, it with them into eternity. It doesn't matter a hill of beans, you know, when it comes down to this life. It's either serve God or don't. It is a choice. God doesn't come to you and strong arm you. God doesn't come to you and twist your arm behind your back and say, you will serve me. No, he, that's where free will comes in. He gives you the choice. And Joshua was coming to the Israelite people and saying the same thing. Hey, you've got a choice. You can serve God or you can go back and serve the gods of the, uh, of the uh, Egyptians or the Amorites in whose while you d deserve. And then he makes this solemn declaration. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. You know, that's a personal declaration. Dare to get involved. You know, you can make the decision today to serve in some way, shape, or form. You say, well, I don't know where I can serve and come to me. You know, I'll find an area for you to serve in. Hey, we're in constant need of people to clean the church, folks. We've got a lot of property. And I know it's not the most glorious job, you know, but it's somewhere to start. It's something simple. It's easy. And it's a service being done unto God. You know, how many of you like using a dirty toilet? Raise your hand. That's what I thought. You know, it takes someone to clean those toilets. You know, and it's not above me to clean it. If I see that the toilet needs to be cleaned, I'll clean it myself. You know, but if everybody in unity in the church got on board with every area that we can, you know what? What could God do with us this year? We can make a difference for God. Dare to get involved. Number four. Look at verse number 24 of Jude. Number four. Two more points. Verse number 24 of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And number four. So we've got number one, determined to stay close to Christ. Number two, deliver compassion to others. Number three, dare to get involved. Number four, desire God's help desire God's help. You know, folks, we can't do it without God. We cannot do it without God. If we try to do it on our own, we will either fail or quit. That's, those are the only th two things that are going to happen from it. We'll either fail or quit. It, I can name individual after individual that I, I've, I've seen that have tried to do things on their own and ended up failing or quitting because of it. Hey, it's discouraging. Folks, you know, if you were to step into my shoes as a pastor just for a week or two, and see how much discouragement it is to work with individuals and see, you know, how frustrating it is. And I, when I say that, don't get me wrong here. You know, I love what I do. I wouldn't trade it for the world. But it's real easy to get depressed. It's real easy to get discouraged if you don't do it with God's help. If I do it within my own flesh, folks, I'm, I'm packing up right now. See ya. 
and I'll go off and do something else. I can't do it on my own. None of us can. This life that you're living, you cannot hope to be successful serving God without God's help. You can't do it on your own. Daily, daily desire God's help. Weekly desire God's help. Every year desire God's help. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, and a very familiar verse in the Bible, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. With Christ, you can do anything. Without him, you can't do anything. You'll fail. You'll end up a flop. Uh, Psalms chapter 37, verse 5, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Hey, if we're going to desire God's help, we need to make a commitment to God this year. If we're going to make the difference, we need to commit ourselves to God. What that means is, hey, Lord, I need you to help me. Lord, I need you to help me to be able to help this individual. Hey, folks, you know, I I'm a human being just like anyone else, and there are times where I get asked questions where I'm at a loss, and I have to go to God and say, Lord, you know, I, I don't know how to answer this question. Lord, I don't know how to help this person. Lord, I need some wisdom. I need some understanding. You know, from time to time, I'll get a text message from someone and say, hey, preacher, I got, I got a question in regards to this. You know, what's the Bible say? Your, your husband, Mrs. Miss Bella, sent me a question this week. I was like, wow, you know what? That's kind of a, I, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about that. You know, the only thing that comes to mind is, is this principle. You know, there are times where that happens, and I have to go to God and say, Lord, you know, that's a hard one. What do you have to say about it? Because it's not my word that matters. It's your word that matters. Desire God's help. Hey, when you wake up in the morning, you know, do you ask God to give you wisdom and guidance throughout the day? Lord, help me today. Lord, help me today to get through today. Or is it just, good morning, honey. Good morning, son. Good morning, you know, daughter. Good morning. Hey, good morning, uh, pooch. You know, if you've got a dog at home. You know, but you, you leave God out of it. You know, I even ask him for help throughout the day. You know, it's, it's, more, it's better for us to desire God's help than to not. Desire it. Ask him for it. Commit your way unto him. And it's not just ask him, saying, Lord, you know, you show me the way, I'll do it. Lord, you give me the, the coordinates, I'll go there. It's a GPS, God's positioning system. That's what the Bible is. You know, hey, Lord, you give me the, the principle, I'll, I'll follow it. You know, one of the things that you can, you can mark this down is this will never give you wrong directions. Not like a GPS does. You know, I, my GPS is giving me so many wrong directions, I can't even count. You know, say, you know, you got God's positioning system, GPS, his Bible. You know, you follow those directions, that, that, desiring that, that his help, and he'll give it to you. Commit your way unto him. Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 through 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hey, folks, you know, desiring God's help, you know, getting God's help, it's so much easier to get through life than do it on your own. You know, I don't know where I would be at today if it wasn't for God. I wouldn't be here, I can tell you that right now. You know, and I've often, 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 you know, I, I uh, keep in contact with, with other individuals that, you know, I know of uh, that are friends of mine that are, are away from God's will. And again, I, I say this very, very uh, uh, humbly speaking because I know I could be right where they're at. You know, they're not chasing after God right now. You know, and they're in a place where they're miserable, miserable. I have a friend of mine that I went to high school with, and, uh, you know, this individual, you know, constantly posts on Facebook, you know, about being depressed and discouraged, and, of course, I reach out to him, and I try to encourage him as much as I possibly can. I know others have as well, but I look at that, and it's like, you know, you're looking in all the wrong places, you know, staring you right in the face, you know, God wants you to have, you know, uh, 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 that happiness and that fulfillment in your life, but you're not going to find it in a bottle. You're not going to find it in drugs. You're not going to find it in the world. It's only going to be found in him. Desire his help. The only way you can get through this life is with his help. You know the reason why people think this is, that they're living hell on earth? is because they're not allowing God to help them. They're not committing their way to God. Make the decision to, to desire God's help, and, and that will help you to make the difference. Number five and last. Look at verse number 25 of Jude. Verse number 25 of Jude. To the only wise God... Our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Number five and last, deem God worthy of all glory. Deem God worthy of all glory. So number one, determine to stay close to Christ. Number two, deliver compassion to others. Number three, dare to get involved. Number four, desire God's help. And number five, deem God worthy of all glory. You know, it's easy for us to go to God and ask him for help. You know, if I were to ask each and every individual in here today, you know, do you ask God for help? Most of you would probably say often. Often I ask God for help. 
Well, how about this? How often do you go back to God after he's given you the help and thanked him for it? You know, we treat God like a genie in a bottle. You know, uh, we, we uh, you know, rub the, the lamp or, you know, whatever the case would be, and, you know, you know, God comes, and what's your wish? You know, Here's my wish, God. You know, but that's it. You know, we don't give him the glory. Or we get prideful. God helps us, and we think, hey, I did that. You know, that's me. We take the glory for ourselves. And that's not what God wants. God wants us to deem him worthy of all glory. Revelation chapter 4. Turn to Revelation chapter 4. It'll be the last verse you can turn to today. I'll give you two other verses along with this. But glory. Hey, folks, who created you? God did. You know what? Everything that we do can only be done because of the strength that he's given you. He is, is worthy of all glory. Folks, the only reason I'm able to stand up here today is because of him. Because of all glory belongs to him. Hey, the only reason I was able to make it from New York, the, you know, upper state New York, to, to back to Bath, Maine last night safely is because of him. It wasn't because of my great driving skills, because you know what? I don't consider myself to be a great driver. You know, there, there are things that are there, and I know you say, well, that's, that just makes sense. That's just, you know, duh. You know, well, you know, sometimes we forget the simple things. You know, the only reason I'm able to breathe today is because God made my body able to do so. And at any point, he can stop it like that if he wanted to. Deem God worthy of all glory. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You know, you weren't created for you. You weren't created for your loved one. You weren't created to take up, you know, space on God's green earth. God created you for him. He, he created you for his glory. That means everything that we do, anything that God allows us to do, we should be able to give him glory and honor, honor for. Psalm chapter 145, verse 3, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. You know, God is great to be praised for everything he's done for us. And, you know, I look at the times where, you know, I could have been hurt in my life. You know, and I look back, and I'm, I'm talking about the circumstance was there. You know, and it was just short of there being a problem. And God protected me from that. I look at that. It wasn't me. You know, there, it shouldn't have turned out that way, but God allowed it to have that protection. You know, God is greatly to be praised for everything. Think about, hey, you know, if you were blessed this Christmas, you know, and we, if we're honest, we're all blessed, you know, we should give God the praise for that. You know, hey, how many of you got to enjoy the heat in your, you know, where you live, you know, during the holidays where it got a little bit cool? You know, I'm sure every single one of us, that's something to praise God for, folks. Hey, you know what I praise God for? When I walked in the door at my house and the heat was on and it was warm in there because, you know what, my parents' house, they do wood, wood stove. And I tell you, it was either way too hot or it was way too cold. You know, I'm like, man, this is just nuts. You know, this is horrible. You know, I get home walking, it's like perfect, consistent heat. You know, <laughs> you know I thank God for that. I told my wife, I go, man, I was so thankful for that. You know, I'm thankful for a bed that's not full of air. You know, I slept on an air mattress this week. You know, I hate air mattresses. They're not comfortable. You know, you get up and you're all stiff and, you know, someone gets out of the bed and almost launches you out of the bed and someone gets on the bed and almost launches you out of the bed. It's like, come on, really? You know, all I want to do is get some good rest. You know, those are simple things to thank God for. You know, God is great. God is great and greatly to be praised in every area. Deem God worthy this year of all glory. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. Last verse, so as I'll read this morning. And, behold, and I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, Heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. There is not one part of creation that does not uh, deserve to, or that does not, is not worthy to not give glory back to God. Everything, everything that God has created should give glory to God. And we are part of that creation. Every single one of us deem God worthy of all glory. The good and the bad. The good and the bad. 
You know, there are times where you don't understand what's there. You know what? We don't. There are times you don't understand it. You know, we went into, into the Christmas holiday, and, you know, I, we, about day, the next day, we, we, came, we got in at 4 a.m. Monday morning, you know, at my parents' house. And, of course, we didn't go to bed until about 5, 36 a.m., you know, and then slept for four or five hours and got up. Well, Tuesday morning, my son wakes up sick. You know, I, I mean, sick, sick. You know, I told my wife, I go, why does this always happen during the holidays? It never fails. First Christmas, Zane, Zane uh, got to celebrate, you know, uh, when he was just almost one years old. You know, he was born in January. He ends up in the ER, you know, the second night. I'm like, really? You know, seriously? And, of course, you know, as a parent, you worry. But I'm thinking, man, why of all times? Why of all times? God, what are you trying to teach me? You know, there's always a lesson to be learned. We don't always see why things go on. You know, and maybe later on down the road, he may look at it and realize, hey, that's why God put it there. God deserves glory in everything. He has a purpose for everything under the heavens. You know, deem God worthy of all glory. This year, give God the glory in everything that happens in your life. You know, before we can make the difference, there is someone that had to make the difference for us. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, he set the example. He made the difference for us. In order for us to be able to successfully make a difference, we must first accept Jesus' sacrifice for us so that we not only can have a home in heaven someday, but to have the power available to make the difference that is needed through him. You know, if you're in here today and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, there and there is no better day than today to make that decision. You know, if you're in here today and you don't know 100% sure without a shadow of a doubt that heaven would be your home, you know what? The end of 2018 is a good time to make that decision. You know, it's a good time to go into 2019 starting that relationship with God to be able to make the difference in someone else's life. You first have to have someone make a difference in yours. You first have to have someone make a difference in yours. The Bible talks about the blind leading the blind. It can't happen. The, a blind person has to get help before the, the other blind person he's trying to help can receive it. You know, we need to receive the help first before we can help someone else. And God has provided that help through his son. If you need to get saved in here today and you need to get assurance of your salvation, whatever the case may be, you can do that today. You can take the opportunity here in a minute. We'll give you that opportunity to get saved. But if you've already done so, I go back to the original question that we asked at the very beginning. Will you make a difference? It's a personal decision. God's not forcing you. God's not strong-arming you. As a pastor, I'm not trying to strong-arm you. All I'm trying to do is to be an encouragement to you. To help you understand that there's someone that God wants you to reach that I might not be able to reach. You can make the decision today to dedicate 2019 and the rest of your life to making a difference for the cause of Christ. Let's make the difference for God. Don't miss out. Someone made the difference for you. Will you make the difference for someone else? Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for every opportunity, Lord, that we get to be in this place. Lord, we thank you so much for the difference that you've made in our lives. Lord, we thank you so much for those that you've made a difference in their life in such a way that they've been able to influence us. Each and every one of us in this room today is, are not self-made men or women. Lord, someone had to have their lives impacted so that they could impact us. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, going into 2019 to make a difference in such a way in our church that it's never been done before. Father, I pray that you would help us to leave those things behind, Lord. And we thank you for the, the last 35 years, Lord, that you've allowed our church to make an impact, Lord, for your sake. Lord, help us to do so in a big way this year, 2019. Lord, use our people in a way, Lord, to, to grow, Lord, beyond where they're currently at, personally, on a personal level. But Lord, as a group collective level, Lord, we'd be able to be a fine-tuned machine to work, Lord, in such a way, in service in such a way, we'd be able to reach more for the cause of Christ. Father, I pray that if there's someone in here this morning that does not know you as their personal Savior, Lord, please help them to make the decision today, the greatest decision they'll ever make, to be able to accept that gift that you have for them, a gift of eternal life through your Son. Lord, if there's someone else that needs to make a decision in one of these areas, Lord, no matter what the area is, Lord, when it comes to making a difference, Lord, help us to make those decisions for you as well. Lord, and we'll give you the praise and glory and honor that you deserve for everything. And we mean everything in our lives. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, the pianist plays, and as we stand, you can come down to an altar at this time.